and then Diana and I are going to present, but we're happy to present now or yeah, I, I got a memo behind the scenes saying uh, we, we changed it up again. So, so okay. unless you're, you're not ready, we could always see this. No, we we okay. are ready and we're, we're happy to be here. So again, my name is Dan Dean. I am an attorney with my sister, Diana Jindati. She's much smarter than me, so I'm going to turn it over to her in a minute. But um, we, as estate planning and trust administration attorneys, we help people set up their estate planning documents. We help people organize their assets so they don't go through probate when they die. And then we help family members with the administration after someone passes away. Um, my husband and I, we had estate planning documents before we got married. We then updated our estate planning documents after we got married. Diana is going to highlight and talk to you about the importance of having estate planning documents, whether you're single or you're married. I just want to highlight that if you don't have documents in place, the, the, there's some real issues and problems and you lose a lot of control. Um, if you have documents in place, you are choosing and you are deciding who takes care of your health if you're incapacitated, who takes care of your assets if you're incapacitated, and where do your assets go when you pass away. If you don't have documents in place, and Diana's gonna, gonna get into this with a, with a chart, is it, it your closest relative will be in charge your closest relative will get your assets for many people especially us who are lgbtq that might not be what we want um so i'm i'm so i'm gonna put in the chat diana's contact information my contact information uh besides being co-workers and siblings we share an email and we share a phone number so uh, it's easy on you. We're going to put that in chat. I'm going to share the screen, Diana, and, and let you start. Um. As Dan's bringing up the screen, let's see. As Dan's bringing up the screen, this is Diana. Okay. Danny, should can you be up, Diana. Yeah, it should be yes, up, Diana. Can you hear me? Okay. So first I want to say I am... Um, so honored and Danny I know I'm speaking for you too we are honored to be here the speakers that you've had that have spoken before us um, we don't want to take all the momentum and all the positivity out of this conference by being the lawyers that eat up the rest of the time and as Karen said we have the slides that are boring she didn't say that but all we have are slides filled with words and so but that's what the laws are it's all words and what we bring hopefully to this conference is the history that we have is estate planning and administration, not just what are the words and what are the documents, but what are our experiences. And Danny is on with me because we are siblings, as he said, and we work together. And he's also helped me, supposed to help me keep me on time. But when he sees that these are all the notes I just took from all the wonderful speakers, he's going to just tell me, go faster. <laughs> Yeah, you speak quickly. You speak quickly to begin with, but today is going to be even on overdrive. But please know we are happy to come back. We are happy to talk more about estate planning. We prepared slides just to kind of give a highlight. But what all the speakers before us has said are even better than what we could say. I was going to say, Thomas, you said expanding your chosen family. The video of the aunties. That's what estate planning is. Who's your family? Who's going to step up and act on your behalf? when you cannot, whether it's in a healthcare situation or in a financial situation. And when it is the end of your life, who have you left your assets to? And have we done that in an organized and clear fashion? Because if we haven't, there are laws in place that were written before there were opposite sex marriages. And they were written when there were same sex marriages. And as the laws continue to evolve and change, we need to make sure that our documents stay proactive and reflect your intentions. Um, as Joe Smidian said, we've been doing estate planning. He didn't say we've been doing estate planning, but it used to be that there was one plan that we would do for people that came in that were opposite sex couples and one that we did for same sex couples. It wasn't until the tax laws changed and they were the same for everyone that we could treat everyone equally and do the same documents for everyone. Having said that, um, what Fred said was to the commitment to yourself, the commitment to say, I would need to make sure that I have my chosen family and I've committed to doing the documents to make sure that takes effect. The control over your estate and what are your intentions are, 
But even with that, there's still, um, there are still challenges in carrying them out. And I am getting, um, let's see, a lot of seniors who don't have anyone to designate in their documents. And so, um, and so let me, um, you know, so if you don't have a chosen family, there are, um, I was, I was going to say, there are companies that serve as fiduciaries in that place, whether it's individuals or a company, to be able to, to know you and to carry out your intentions. So let me go just give you a highlight of the slides that we have, just to make sure that I try to cover what you can expect in estate planning. So this first one is as boring as boring can be, table of consanguinity. This is just who um, inherits if you don't have any documents in place. Um, and this is, again, this is California law, and it, it's, it's very standard. It's just, okay, down to children, up to parents. So, Danny, I don't think we, I think we've seen enough of that one. But yeah. this is showing that your documents can override these um, statutory assumptions, if that makes sense. The next two slides are just showing that if you have assets that do not have beneficiaries designated, typically we break your assets into two groups. What is what are the assets that have beneficiaries, such as retirement accounts, life insurance, annuities? When you create or, or when you obtain or set up those accounts, you designate who the beneficiaries are. If something happens to you, if you pass away, that institution will pay those assets out to those individuals. Other assets, such as you may have brokerage account or you may have a house that are that, that do not set up the beneficiaries when you buy a home. There's a deed to your home. It doesn't say, when I die, who does it pass to? This chart of probate is just showing if you have assets that exceed $166,250, that's the California statute. If you have that amount of assets without a beneficiary designated, you'll go into the court process. And the reason we show, which is known as probate, which is, um, Public, long, and expensive. And so these, this slide and the next slide are just showing going through probate is um, the fees for the attorney and for the executor are calculated on the gross value of the estate. Again, just to show if you had a house that was worth a million dollars, the um, fees for the attorney would be 23000 Fees for executor would be 23000 Not what anybody wants to have. This is why people look for in California to establish a revocable living trust. So those assets can be, um, let me just say, bypass the probate process. Um, the next slide that we have- well, Diana, can I, I jump, can I jump oh, in yes, real please. quickly? And yes. just say that, that you know, estate planning is two big goals. One is to get your documents in place. You know, who's gonna make your decisions for you and where do your assets go? But as equally important as your documents, is to get your assets organized in a way, and that's what we do and we help you with, or any estate planning attorney will help you with, get your assets organized so that when you die, nothing goes to probate. The goal is nothing, you don't want anything going to probate. So as important as your documents is how are you handling your assets? Thanks, and Diana, here's the next I slide. was gonna say, and, then, and, and as the question was, who do you have in your chosen family to name to act on your behalf, and if not, there are um, corporate trustees that can be through the bank to handle the financial matters, but there's also private professional fiduciaries that typically work on an hourly basis that can serve on your behalf in your financial matters if needed, and also in your healthcare matters as needed. Healthcare matters, what we've shown here are just a general overview of the healthcare documents. The typical ones are the HIPAA um, authorization, which relates to who can talk to the doctors and access your medical records. The next document we typically prepared is, is a power of attorney for your personal care decisions. And this is to name who can step in if you are incapacitated to say wh what level of care you need, where you should live, who should take care of you, kind of all the daily living activities um, until you need or if you need the next document, which is the advanced health care directive, which lays out if you need someone to make medical or end of life decisions for you, who would that be? There's a few more on there that do not resuscitate, 
the POLST, Physician Order for Life Sustaining Treatment, and the Natural Death Act. Those are all available in um, when the time comes, if you're, um, if the circumstances warrant, those are typically done with your doctor though, okay. And, and although Diana and I are attorneys, which means we love paperwork, we don't create all these health documents just to have a big stack of paper. We don't know what situation you may end up in. So these different documents we feel will help cover all issues from A to Z regarding health and personal care. So depending on the situation you're in, your chosen person has the right documents to ask. And I just got a reminder, which is excellent. You want to do these documents when you are well. Um, these, I always say, estate planning documents are like creating um, or establishing your toolbox. You don't know what you're going to need or in what order you're going to need them. So please do them when you are not, um, I should say, when you're not stressed as we're all sitting here in a pandemic. But when you're not facing a surgery, when you're not facing um, just real health issues, when your mental capacity is good and strong and you can make these decisions clear-headed and put your best team together that you can. Um, okay, and so. On a, on a more positive note, even yes, if, you're, please. <laughs> if, if the pandemic's over and you're going to Paris for three months, don't wait till the day before you're leaving to set up all your documents. Yes. So before COVID, people typically were doing estate planning. Some were doing it because they just wanted to do it. Some people were going typically when there was a deadline and we often found that deadline was surgery or a vacation. We're not seeing many vacations right now or many surgeries, but it is just, again, back to being in control of your life and your decisions and your chosen family so that it is in place when you need it. The next slide is just trying to show that there are financial estate planning documents. Um, the first one we reference is the financial estate planning documents that you may already have if you have a retirement account or an annuity or a life insurance. Then we look at um, if you became, um, I'm going to give the example, if you became incapacitated, we prepare a financial power of attorney to give that trusted person authority to access your retirement account if you're incapacitated and money is needed to be withdrawn, for example, for your care. Then we've just laid out a will and a will is the best description, the will is really like a letter to the judge. It's a, in a different format, but it is saying, what are your intentions? Who should serve and act on your behalf and who should inherit? But again, in California, if those assets exceed $166,250, it can trigger the probate. So that is why we've also li listed the revocable living trust. Because California's probate fees are so high, the revocable living trust is much more popular than in many, many other states because it is the only way they can, we can avoid this probate process. Okay, I know we are going fast. We're, we're going fast. <laughs> I just wanted to also jump in and say, Diana, um, something that you and I were talking about, which is, you know, a lot of our LGBTQ clients, um, if even if they're married, they might not share the same name as their spouse. And so even more reason Maybe your spouse, let's say you didn't have documents. Your spouse does have some rights, but it may be complicated. It may be confusing. You may be traveling to other states who are not as progressive as California. And so again, the, yes. the, the doing these documents, it's not just for when you die. There's a lot of things that happen um, during your life where these documents come into play. And I will say, to, to add to that, as we've seen people live longer, there is become, it used to be that you did estate planning because you were alive and then you passed away. So what do we need to do when you pass away? Now there's many more people that are living longer with maybe dementia or Alzheimer's and there's, um, we want to address incapacity as well. And as Dan has pointed out, some of the challenges with estate planning are making sure that your intentions are carried out. And some of the, um, like Dan, you're pointing out, if we have a couple that is together, with, maybe they're married, maybe they're not, but they might not have the same last name. So we want those healthcare documents in place so that your significant other can have act, you know, can see you in the hospital. Again, under COVID conditions, that may only be one person, but pre-COVID and post-COVID, that pre-COVID it was much looser. Um, same that we've seen with same-sex couples doing estate planning together 
transferring a home into the trust. They don't have the, necessarily the same last name. We've encountered with the county that they want more documentation to show that this does not result in a transfer of increased property taxes. And that, I didn't mean to lead in with it, but there is a slide just about taxes. When we're doing estate planning, we're looking at estate taxes, we're looking at income tax, capital gains taxes, and we're looking at real property taxes. As you can see, we try to be holistic and address not just the documents, but also what finan financial ramifications your estate plan has um, to, the sp to your spouse and to your beneficiaries. And this area is um, very volatile, I would say, at this time. It just, it's, it's as much as we wanna plan, we don't know what, um, what Congress may do, what a new president may do, um, but it is something that we check as we're doing the estate plan. Currently, under, or under current law, your assets um, total, all your assets, if they are less than 11, approximately 11.5 million, it can pass to your beneficiaries without a state tax. However, if you have a retirement account that's not a Roth IRA, this is where income taxes come in, that if you pass a retirement account to a beneficiary that is not a spouse or a spouse, as they take money out or withdraw money out, it's subject to income tax. The laws changed the end of last year. When you leave a retirement account to a spouse, they can take it out over their lifetime. That used to be true for non-spousal beneficiaries as well. The law just changed and said, no, non-spousal beneficiaries only have 10 years to take out that retirement account. So, and then real property taxes, again, um, under Prop 13, there is, um, there's no increase in property taxes by the transfer between spouses. Um, there are certain exclusions transferring property to children. And we know that there's propositions on the ballot right now that may affect regarding the parent-child exclusion. Okay. And just, just for a time check, we have our final slide, and I know we're going fast. Everybody will be relieved. <laughs> yes, yes. We're done talking about taxes. <laughs> okay. Oh, no, now we get to talk about death. That's no, that's no small comfort. <laughs> so we put this slide in, an outline of trust administration deadlines. Very often people think they've done their estate planning, they did a revocable trust, someone passes away, there's nothing to do. This is just here to show that when someone does pass away, there still is an administration process. And what you are doing is the person who has died, their financial matters and obligations need to be wound up. And so we just have an overview here to show kind of what are the activities you do typically in the first 30, 60 days, nine months, 12 months, and sometimes as long as 15 months. Um, I don't know if we just put everybody to sleep, but I hope everybody hung on. <laughs> You're going to need that stretch break. <laughs> yeah. Diana, thank you. I'm glad I let you do most of the talking because, again, you're much smarter than me. I'm no. going to stop sharing, and I'm going to go 